21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. What do you mean, robbed lady? Held up? Oh, burglars. Well, when did this happen? It was during the night? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah, they'll be there right away. You just wait for them. What? Oh, yeah. You're welcome. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their home is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., A light rain had fallen early in the morning, and the temperature had suddenly dropped, making the streets icy and treacherous. At 7.35, after I changed to my uniform, I sat in my office to begin reading and signing the reports and communications that had accumulated since I was last on duty 24 hours earlier. At 2 minutes to 8, Sergeant Burns on T.S. rang into my office and told me the 8 to 4 platoon was ready to turn out. Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, pressed a button that rang a bell in the back room, and the 47 men who would patrol the streets of the 21st for the next eight hours marched out in a military manner and formed ranks in front of the desk. As I walked out of my office, I crossed the muster room and went behind the desk where the roll call for entry in the blotter was being made by Lieutenant Gorman. Turner? Here. Underwood? Here. Weber? Here. Weeks? Present. Wolf? Yeah. Ziegler? Present. You want to take over, Captain? Yeah. All right, men. A few things. We have instructions to assist the borough president's office in a survey of certain street conditions. Each of you will take note of any street opening now in progress on your post. You will talk to the foreman in charge of the job and ascertain what public utility or city department has opened the street, for what purpose, and the approximate date and time the repairs will be completed. All this information will be entered in your memorandum books and at the end of the tour will be transferred to a UF-20A and turned into the desk officer. The uh, streets and sidewalks are icy and dangerous today. In cases that so require, you will call the attention of householders and storekeepers to their legal obligations to remove ice from the sidewalks. That's all. Sergeant, post the platoon. Platoon, that's hut. Right face. Forward, hut. I'll be in my office, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Go ahead, take the call. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. Well, would you excuse me, please? You'll have to take yeah. the business over here at the desk, mister. Well, what kind of a wreck? Automobile? Well, I'd just like to talk to the captain in a minute. What is it you want? Was well, anyone hurt? Oh, that's all right, Lieutenant. I'll talk to him. I know him. Well, how bad? You need yes, an ambulance? Hello, Ralph. What can I do for captain? you? Captain, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. When did you get out of the service? Oh, Two or three months ago? Yeah. I'm in business again over at 697. I opened a little radio and TV repair shop. Well, what hospital? Oh, yes. I think I passed the place. Uh, I didn't know well, it was I yours. The officer's over there right away. Uh, what is it you have on your mind? Well, I, I got a kid brother, Paul. Mm-hmm. He's 16. He'll be 17. I'm a little worried about it. Yeah, you just wait there. Oh, well, uh, come on in my office. The officer will be right there. He's a good kid, I guess. But he gets himself into some awful jams. Go ahead. Thanks. All right, Ralph, have a seat. Yeah, thanks. What kind of jams? Well, it might be the other kids he runs with in the neighborhood. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Does he live in the precinct? Oh, yeah, in the same block as the store. My mother. I used to live there, too, before I got married. My folks lived there for years. That's how I come to open the store on the block. Well, uh, what's this trouble he's had? Uh, they had him down here last night. Ah, uh, who? The detectives, he said. They came around to the candy store. He hangs out with the other kids, and they picked him up. They brought him in here... And talk to him a while. And then they let him go home. Well, what did they talk to him about? Stealing. I don't think he'd done anything like that, though. What, what does he need it for? He doesn't need to steal. Well, what uh, specifically did they talk to him about? About some flats in the neighborhood that had been broken into. And a store. Uh, Flores over on 2nd Avenue. One of the kids ran over and told my mother he'd been arrested. She got all excited and called me on the telephone at home. By the time I got here, they, they, they let him go. 
Maybe they decided he had nothing to do with it. Maybe. But uh, what I would like, Captain, would be for you to talk to him. Uh, you know what I mean. I, I can't do it. He don't have much respect for what I say. And, and we got no father. He always said he wanted to be a cop. He still says it. I figure if you could talk to him, maybe that'll straighten him out. He'll realize what the score is. Oh, wait a minute. I thought you said that you thought he didn't have anything to do with that stuff. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know what to think. My wife, Stella, can't stand him. She thinks he's sneaky. My mother thinks he's an angel. The kid, when you talk to him, father wouldn't melt in his mouth. I don't know what to think. Would you talk to him, Captain? Oh, that's a job for our youth patrolman. Well, the kid needs somebody to make an impression on him, Captain. A real impression. Couldn't you just spend a couple of minutes with him as a personal favor to me? All right, if you want. I'll bring him in here this afternoon, if that's okay. Uh, at school. No, I, I don't think it'd be a good idea to talk here. He might be a little uneasy. Yeah, yeah, he might at that after last night. What time does he get home from school? About four, a little after. Well, could you have him uh, in your shop at 4.30? I'll come by and see him there. Yeah, sure, that'd be fine. I'll have him there. 4.30 this afternoon. Yeah, I'll see you there. Thanks, Captain. Thanks a lot. That's all right. Bye. Bye, Ralph. Uh, Sergeant, ring the detectives for me. Yes, sir. Twenty-first squad, Detective Cassidy. This Captain Kennelly is Lieutenant King around? Uh, no, sir. The lieutenant's swinging today. Oh yes. Uh, look, somebody was talking to a boy up there last night about some burglaries. Paul Hans. Can you find out for me who was handling those squeals? Uh, yes, sir. It was me, Captain. Uh, what did you want to know? Well, uh, what about it? Was he right for them? About breaking into the flats, I don't know for sure, Captain. But that kid was inside the florist shop for sure. Oh, why'd you turn him out? He denies the whole thing, and I had nothing to hold him on. Just the information from another kid that Paul showed him $20 and told him it came out of the shop. Paul says the other kid is a liar. He never had $20. Well, he still had 11 in his pocket. Oh. I asked him where he got it. He said he wanted playing cards in a club room. The boy just sat here and lied to me for two hours. And polite. You never met anyone so polite. He's the politest liar I ever saw. Well, what are you doing about him, Cassidy? Well, I'm going to keep my eye on him and talk to him after every break in. His, uh, his brother wants me to talk to him. See if I can straighten him out. Does he? Yep. I'm going to see him this afternoon. Well, I wish you luck, Captain. That boy's a walking corkscrew. At 4.15, sector car number three came by the house and drove me to 690 East 70th Street, an old law tenement building. The first floor had been converted to commercial purposes. The front rooms on one side were occupied by a beauty parlor. Those on the other by Ralph Hans radio repair shop. I walked up the stoop and into the hall. Through the glass door, I could see a young woman sitting at the counter, thumbing through the pages of a magazine. Hello. Oh, hello. You're that captain. Captain Kennelly, yes. Ralph's in the back. I'm his wife. Ralph! Let me turn this thing off. Ralph, that captain's here. All right. He's back there working on a rush job. The customer wants it back in time for the fight tonight. You're going to talk to the kid, huh? Paul. That's right. You're wasting your time. Ralph! All right. He'll smile at you and say, yes, sir, no, sir, and he'll go right out and do what he pleases. Boy, look at that casserole. The magazine gives you a recipe and a picture in color and tells you how to make it in every detail. You think it ever turns out like the picture? Never. Ralph! One second. You know, that kid's been lying and stealing since he was able to walk. He's just rotten, through and through. But don't quote me. Ralph's mother will jump down my throat. She thinks he's an angel. Ah. Excuse me, Captain. That's all right. I was soldering a new condenser in the radio. I I couldn't let it go. Sorry. Well, where's Paul? He'll be here. Well, a captain's a busy man. Paul should be here waiting for the captain instead of the captain waiting for Paul. Oh, it's just 430 It's a waste of time and effort with that kid. How do you know it's a waste of time and effort? He's no good. Now, you've got no right to say that, Stella. Just because some kid in the neighborhood is mad at Paul and lied to the police about him, you've got no right. The detectives let him go, didn't they? Just because they couldn't prove it. I don't have to prove it. I know. So do you. I don't know. Sure. You're still a little boy. You listen to everything Mama tells you. If Mama told you to go jump in the river, you jump. All right, Stella. Mama tells you Paul's an angel, so he's an angel. All right. Well, it's true. 
Uh, I'm sorry, Captain. That's all right, but uh, instead of arguing over what the truth is, I think we'd all do better for him if we pay a little more attention to the future. The boy needs help. Whether he's guilty or not, he's been suspected, been questioned by detectives. That uh, might have some detrimental effect in itself. The job is to see that he's headed in the right direction and stays headed that way. That's what I meant, Captain. That's why I wanted you to talk to him, exactly. Oh, sure. Paul? No, it's not Paul. Me. Well, where's Paul, Ma? I didn't tell him to come. He's home. But the Captain made a special trip to talk to him. This is Captain Kennelly, Ma. Miss Hans? How do you do? There's nothing to talk about, so I didn't tell him. Why should he talk to the Captain if there's nothing to talk about? Something to talk about, all right. Stella, I'm ashamed of you. Ashamed. Your own brother-in-law. You know that Paul is a good boy. A very good boy. He goes to school. Every day he goes to school. And to church on Sunday. He's a good boy. But he would never do anything like that. Go ahead. Convince yourself. I don't need to convince myself. I know my own sons. I know them better than anybody. Well, uh, there wouldn't be any harm in speaking to him, Mrs. Hans. There's been plenty of harm already take a nice boy like that to the police station to, to ask him all kinds of questions to make a criminal out of him. No one can make a criminal out of him, Mrs. Hans. He's got to do that himself. A good boy like that. You know what it is, don't you? It's the neighborhood. No matter how good a boy he is, if he grows up in this neighborhood, he hasn't got a chance. You don't give him a chance. I wouldn't say that, Mrs. Hans. Look at Ralph. He grew up in exactly the same place. He seems to have turned out okay. Very little is written or said about one of the most important members of our armed forces. But he's accustomed to doing his work without fanfare or publicity. That's because he has a very personal relationship with the men around him. He's their chaplain. He hears their problems and gives them advice. He joins a couple in marriage, christens their children, gives them religious counsel. His job doesn't begin with reveille and end at taps. It's a 24-hour job when he's needed by the sick or wounded or imprisoned. No matter what his faith may have been before he joined the chaplain's corps... He's prepared to help men of any faith in their religious activities. To him come the most personal thoughts of the men he serves. For religion is always a personal thing. The problems are many times more complex than he would find in a civilian community, but he finds his reward in seeing those problems solved. The emergency furlough he's been able to arrange for a man with illness in the family. The private talk that helped a new recruit with a touch of homesickness. The words of encouragement and advice to a man in trouble. These are important to the people he serves. They are the things that make the chaplain an important part of life in the armed forces. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Frank Kennelly. After a few more minutes of discussion, Mrs. Hans was finally convinced by her older son, Ralph, that no harm could possibly come from my speaking to Paul and that the conversation might do a lot of good. We left Ralph and his wife in the shop and Miss Hans reluctantly led the way out of the store to a building down the block, a house in which she resided. We walked up three floors to the flat she occupied with Paul. Someday. Someday, if my sons ever become successful enough, maybe I'll live in a house with an elevator. Someday. Well, I hope so. <sighs> the nice kitchen with a brand new icebox. He's in the kitchen with his homework. You'll see. He's doing his homework. He don't wait until the last minute late at night to do it. As soon as he comes from school. Well, that's a good boy, isn't it? If he's prompt with his homework. Oh, it's a good sign. You'll, uh, let me talk to him alone, Miss Hans. I, uh, I think that would be better. Oh, yes, sure. I got some ironing in the bedroom to do. Fine. I got my keys someplace. Yeah, here it is. Paul? Yeah, Ma. You see? Homework. Come in, Captain. Thank you. Did you take an apple, Paul? There's some apples under the sink, dear. No, I wasn't hungry, Ma. Hello. Paul? Paul, this is Captain Kennelly from the police station. How do you do? How are you, Paul? Your brother was over there and talked to the captain today. You know, about what happened last night. Uh-huh. Uh, they decided it would be nice if Captain Kennelly came and talked to you. About what? Oh, just about you, Paul. In general. Oh, sure. If you want. There's some coffee on the stove, Ma. Maybe Captain Kennedy would like a cup. Uh, no, thanks. Not now. It's, uh, Kennelly. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. 
A lot of people make mistakes. Are you sure no coffee, Captain? It was just fresh this afternoon. No, no, thank you. Well, I... I gotta do some ironing in the bedroom. All right, Ma. You can talk, huh? Oh, Paul. Yes, Ma? If the captain changes his mind about the coffee, you'll pour him a cup, all right? Sure. There's milk in the ice box. Oh, sit down, Paul. Yes, sir. What's that you're doing? Solid geometry. You good at it? Yes, sir. Pretty good. How about the rest of your subjects? Pretty good. Are your grades good enough so you can go on to college? I'd like to. But I don't know. Ralph has got a lot of responsibilities now. I really should go to work after I finish high school and help out a little bit. Ralph told me you said you wanted to be a cop. Yes, sir. I, I thought about it. Uh, it takes a long time to get in the job and uh, a lot up here. I know. Also, you've got to have a clean record. Yes, sir. That's the first thing. Without that, nothing else does you any good. What happened last night won't show up against me, will it? They just took me down to the police station and talked to me. I didn't know anything about breaking into any stores or anything like that. No, no, that won't count against you. There've got to be convictions. Oh. Would you like an apple, Captain? No, thank you, Paul. I think I'm ready for one myself now. All right, go ahead. I tell Marsh you ought to keep them in the icebox. She's been keeping them under the sink for years. I guess it's hard to change habits. It is, yes. You sure, Captain, no apple? Positive. Still no coffee either, huh? No. It only take a second. No, I, I don't care for any, thanks. Okay. Really good. As a matter of fact, a conviction wouldn't only hurt you as far as getting on the cops is concerned. It'd make it kind of rough for you all around. Yes, sir, I know. Of course, there's case after case of boys getting in trouble and straightening themselves out afterwards. And a lot of them never get straightened out, huh? That's right. Never. One jam after another. All their lives. I really didn't break in any place like that detective said. Well, that's not why I'm here, Paul. Right now, it doesn't make much difference whether you did or not. We can't help what's happened. I guess we can't. But uh, what happens in the future is uh, entirely a different story. Yes, sir. You know, a kid breaks in someplace or mugs somebody for the thrill of it or to get a little money out of it, he's a loser. He just doesn't pay. Believe me. I've been in this job a long time. I've seen more kids than I could count, sitting just like you're sitting right now. Nothing's free, Paul. You've got to pay for everything. And the hardest way to pay for it is with years out of your life. You can't earn them back. They're gone. Yes, sir. Oh, I know what you're thinking right now. This guy's giving me a lecture. No, sir, I'm not thinking that. Well, I am. I hate to give lectures and I hate to receive them. But this is one instance where it's called for. I didn't break into any place. My word of honor. I told you, that was beside the point. Yes, sir. The point is, what's going to happen from now on? You got my word, Captain. Your word for what? But I'm never going to get mixed up in anything like that. Good. You don't have to tell me it doesn't pay. I know it. I'm glad you do, Paul. It's a soccer deal. I want to make something of myself. I want to get on the cops or, or something like that. I want to get married like everybody else, like Ralph, and have a family. You can't do that messing around with that other. Okay, Paul. I think you understand what I was driving at. Yes, sir, I do. And I really appreciate you coming over to talk to me like this. I know you didn't have to. When my brother asked you, you could have said nuts. What do I care for the kid? You could have said it. Well, I want to tell you something. If more cops would come around the kids' houses and sit in the kitchen like this and talk, there'd be a lot less trouble you'd have with, what do you call it, juvenile delinquency. I thoroughly agree with you, Paul. That's why I'm here. The only thing is, I don't go for getting picked up in a candy store by a detective and taken into the station house like I was last night and sat down in the chair and tossed a lot of questions. And then not being believed when I tell the truth. You weren't mistreated in any way, were you? No. Uh, unless you want to call being arrested in front of all your friends being mistreated. Maybe it, maybe it is. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I was getting mad up there last night. What's the use, I thought? Why go through this for nothing? If you're going to get the business like this, it might as well be for something. Okay, if they think you break into flats and stores and they won't believe anything else, go ahead. Break into flats and stores. That's what I was thinking. But you're not thinking that way anymore. Oh, no, sir. Thanks to you. Good. But don't blame the detectives. They've got their job to do. I guess they have. How about that cup of coffee now, Captain? All right, I think I will, Paul. Good. You take milk in it? 
No, just black. It's good and hot. Well, that's the way I like it. Whoa, oh, that's enough. Sugar, Captain? Please. Ah, there's none in the bowl. I'll ask my ma. Oh, that's all right. Ma? Yes, Paul? Where's the sugar? I'll come in and get it. Okay. Well, you didn't have to bother your mother. I like it this way, too. She doesn't mind, I'm sure. There's no sugar in the bowl? No, ma, it's empty. Well, there's a five-pound bag in the closet, Paul. Over here? In this closet? That's right. You see it? Yeah, I see it, ma, yeah. He's a good boy, Captain. I've got a good boy. I think he'll turn out that way, Miss Hans. A good boy. It was 5.15 when I returned to the station house. I signed the blotter and went into my office to read and sign reports and communications that had accumulated during the tour. At 6 o'clock, I changed from my uniform to civilian clothes and walked out into the muster room. Oh, Captain. Did you get to talk to the Hans kid? Yes, I spent about a half an hour with him at his house. What do you think? Ah, I think he might turn out all right. Are you, Captain? Yeah. He's an intelligent kid. Told me he wants to do the right thing. Seems to know the direction he's headed in. Yes, sir, that's the trouble. He knows, but we don't. I left Cassidy and went over behind the desk and signed the blotter to go off the job. It had started to snow as I walked to the subway. By the time I got off the train near my home in Queens, the streets were already covered. It continued to snow all night, and by morning, six inches of it was on the ground. I was due back on the job at 4 p.m. the next afternoon, but because of the weather, I started out a little early. I got into the station house at 3.25 and walked toward the desk to sign the blotter. Hello, Captain. Oh, Sergeant, what's doing? Oh, it's a quiet tour. Good. Except for the weather. Uh, I'll sign the blotter. Yes, sir. All right. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. Hello, is uh, Captain Kennelly there? Oh, he's busy right now. Who's this calling, please? This is Ralph Hans. Ralph who? Hans. H-A-N-T-S? He knows me. I was there yesterday. He was to my shop. It's very important. I'll be in my office, Sergeant. Hold on a second, please. Captain? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ralph Hans on the phone for you. He says he knows you. Oh, yes. I'll, uh, I'll take it on the extension here. Yes, sir. Hold on, Mr. Hans. Captain Kennelly will talk to you. All right, go ahead, Captain. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Ralph Hans, Captain. I'm glad I caught you in. Oh, what's the trouble, Ralph? Don't you know? I thought maybe you could give me some help. Well, I just now came in. What's the trouble? Well, I was out on a service call. My wife says my mother came in the shop all excited. A detective was at the house and went through Paul's things. The detective told her another detective went to the school to get him. Why? I don't know. That's why I'm calling. My wife said my mother ran out and went to the police station. I don't know what happened. I, I thought everything was all right. Well, so did I. Can I find out something? As soon as I do, Ralph. You call me back or come over here. Did you see my mother there? No, I told you. I just got in. You call me back, Ralph. Yeah. yeah all right, Captain. In about a half an hour. Bye. Is uh, Cassidy upstairs, Sergeant? Yes, sir. I saw him go up about 20, 25 minutes ago. He had a kid with him. Oh, 16, 17 years old. Good-looking kid, blonde. Yes, sir. Shall I ring upstairs for Cassidy? No, uh, I'll go up myself. Yes, sir. I'm going upstairs to the detectives, Red. Yes, sir. Huh? They took Paul again. They got him up there, up in the detectives. All right, Miss Hans. You said it was all right. You said it was a good boy. I'm going up to find out about it now. Oh. Please, Captain, tell them he's a good boy. He is. He did nothing. Now, look, Miss Hans, there's nothing you can do here now. You better go on home. Yes, that's what the detectives told me, but there must be something. There must. You better go on home. I spoke to Ralph, and he's going to call me back. Oh, my poor boy. When he does, I'll tell him everything I can find out. Now, you better go on home. You tell Ralph. You tell him. I will, yes. <clears throat> Hello, Captain. Hi, Novak. Cassidy. Hello, Captain. You, uh, got Paul Hanson here, hmm? Uh, yes, sir. He's sitting in the lieutenant's office. Lieutenant King with him? Uh, no, sir. I'm waiting for him to get back to talk to him. What's the trouble? There was a candy store broken into on 2nd Avenue last night. They took about $40 in cash, two boxes of cigars, and lifted a postage stamp machine off the counter. Yeah? We got some information on it this afternoon and picked up one boy. He admitted being in on the deal. He said Paul Hans was with him. We went over to Paul's house this afternoon and found a stamp machine under his bed. I sent down and got him out of school. 
In addition to this, he now admits burglarizing the florist in three flats in the neighborhood. I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Help yourself, Captain. Well, Paul, looks like we wasted a lot of time yesterday, huh? Yes, sir, I guess we did. You're in it up to here now, Paul. I don't know what the cure is, do you? Look, I know I've been greasing you along, you and my mother and my brother. And even me. But I made a mistake, that's all. I made a mistake, and and I'm sorry. So did I, Paul. I made a mistake, too. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Burns. Who shot? Well, where is this? Wait just a minute. Don't talk so fast. That's thirty-four twenty-two. Is that right? Yeah. An arrest him. Well, who shot him? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, who are you? All right. Now just just take it easy. Calm down. Now talk slow. All right. Right, and so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Featured in tonight's cast were Eileen Palmer, Rainer Rayburn, Wendell Holmes, Joe DeSantis, Santos Ortega, and Martin Newman. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced by John Ives. Art Hannis speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.